Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beelance and Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. We're recording this on the middle Sunday of Wimbledon. This is the last year of no tennis on the middle Sunday of Wimbledon. So we thought it was a great idea to give a mid-tournament review of what has occurred so far and what we have to look forward to in week two. I'm happy to have on my co-host and Hall of Famer, Steve Flink, to join me on this episode. Let's get right into it, Steve. Before we uh, go into some detail, how about some brief initial thoughts on what was a packed and interesting week one? It was. It, it, no, there were some sad moments. Uh, I, I, I think initially of that awful period of only about an hour apart where Manorino goes down with his knee injury against Federer and then unable to play the fifth set after he'd led Roger two sets to one. And, and then Serena, same, same side of the court, same court, down and out first round. So those were poignant, sad moments to be sure. Then I, I also think of the really inspiring performance from Francis Tiafo to knock off uh, Stefanos Tsitsipas in straight sets. Uh, that was kind of a shocker because I really thought that Tsitsipas was headed onto the semifinals. And then there was just a lot of very good tennis all week. Those, but those are my initial impressions. I, I think of that I, uh, above all else, the sad moments with the Federer match and Serena bowing out and then the upset of Francis Tiafo. And otherwise, it's just been a lot of inspiring tennis. We had some more interesting Nick Kyrgios moments as well to, to savor or not to savor. But I think uh, it's all worked out very nicely, David. Yeah, it has. And, and I think um, to, to just start, let's continue on the theme of, of the surface because, um, you know, Roger, I would say Roger was a little fortunate there. He was up a break in the fourth when it happened, but he was not playing his best tennis. He's looked a lot better since that match. but. Um, Obviously, and Roger even admitted, you know, he didn't say he was definitely going to lose. I don't think anyone could say that, but Roger was fortunate as far as the timing goes of that match because Manorino was playing very well. Yeah, I would say this, David. My my feeling was Roger looked very uh, despondent and forlorn at the end of the third set. He was not happy because he had lost, played a terrible tiebreaker to lose the second set. His forehand went totally awry. And then it, he didn't play well in the third either. Manorito really kept the pressure on him and had a break point at the start of the fourth. And I thought that's really where Federer did, did start to play his best tennis. First three sets, not at all. Four said he was improving. And I, I had the feeling if he got it to a fifth, which it looked like he would, that he would have prevailed. But to not even, for poor Manorito, not to even have the opportunity to, to be out there fighting for it was, was a shame. I did yeah. think Federer's form started to improve in the fourth. It was not very good in the first three. I would agree with you. And and if we, we stick with um, the other player, obviously that was majorly affected by it was Serena. And you've said it, a lot of people have said it in the past. I mean, this was her best chance to get that one more major, right. And for it to happen at three, three in the first set, um, you know, I don't know if it, it, if it's worse, if you do it three, three in the first set or three, three in the final set of the Wimbledon final, it's, it's bad, no matter which way you look at it. Um, I think that, I think the latter would have been worse to David. If you get that close and, and somehow you can't claim the elusive prize, but when it's first round, yes, it's deeply disappointing, but she just has to go back to the drawing board, try to heal and see if there's any way she can really be uh, physically at hundred percent for the U S open, because if she's not, it, it just won't happen. It, it was, it was unfortunate for her because she, like all the other leading players never got to play Wimbledon last year it was the one major, which was not played. And obviously she would have been a strong contender then as well. So tough break for Serena, but she did get some showered with applause by the crowd, both coming on and off the court. And that seemed to, she, she certainly acknowledged it in, in one of her social media posts, how much that meant to her. Yeah. Um, let's stick with the other name that you were talking about. And that's Francis Tifo uh, upset French open finals. As you said, Stefano Tsitsipas. It's often, especially with, with younger players, you have that usual hangover from, you know, just playing on the clay, going over to the grass, um, especially not having that extra week um, this year. Um, Francis, really good run. I was hoping a little bit more against Kachanov. Kachanov beat him in straight sets. Um, you can't say it was a disappointing tournament for Francis at all. Not, I mean, it was a good run. It, he gives you like a little momentum to really hop on board. And then he just doesn't quite get over the edge yet, but still plenty of time. You know, David, he said something I thought was very revealing that I think he's going to have to grow out of. And that is this. He commented that he never, after the Sitsipas match and, and the crowd was 
enjoying the interview with him. And as you know, this is the first year we're doing these post-match interviews on the court for the public, which is wonderful. And he was smiling and beaming and, and appreciative of what their applause for him. But he said it probably would not have happened had he been on a side court. There's a part of Francis that's still more showman than craftsman. And I don't mean that as a knock because I like his craftsmanship, but I think that I'd like to see him sustain it a little bit more. And as you alluded to in his loss, he did not, it wasn't a great performance. It's not as if he bowed out in five tumultuous sets, you know, he was beaten pretty soundly and that, that was a bit disappointing, but yes, some progress. He had one more win after he beat Stefanos and, so, yes, he got to the third round, but we need to start seeing him if he's going to really if there's going to be some change in him. And if we're going to see some long term success, I'd like to see him start getting to some 16s and quarters of majors and build from there. Well, I think uh, this next person we're going to talk about, we are we have already seen some uh, great success. And that's from young Sebastian Corda. So calm, cool and collective um, beats Alex DiMinar in a tough first round matchup there. Alex is not easy to play. Beats Daniel Evans in the third round. He hits 51 winners Monday, tomorrow. He turns 21 and faces the guy that Francis Tifo bought out to. Karin Kachanoff, I know you're, you're so high on this kid. Tell me about him, and, and do you think he, he, he's going to win tomorrow? Well, he's had a kind of an emotional uh, three victories there. He's had, to, you know, he's had to work hard in all those matches, and he was getting a little frustrated at the end against Steven Hour, but he managed to put him away. So he's knocked off two seeds. He's had three wins. Wimbledon debut, round of sixteen. Yeah, odds I have to believe slightly in his favor to win tomorrow. Uh, then we'll see about the quarters. You know, that would depend. You have to wonder, is he is he going to play uh, Bautista Good or Denis Shapovalov? And, right. and either one of those will be severe tests, although he just beat Bautista Good. But I I think he really realizes this is a big opportunity for him. If he can stay as composed as he is, his tennis is talking very well for him. Now he just has to keep that conversation going, keep moving forward and, and not get too uh, preoccupied with the fact that he's playing his first Wimbledon with a, potentially a shot at the semifinals. Uh, tomorrow, I do like his chances probably to win in four. I will say this, Steve, um, when you look at the, the players um, and may outside of Novak or whatever, can he lose to the players that he could potentially face? Yes. But can he beat those players that he would potentially face? I think you can also say yes. And I think that's a compliment when you say someone as young as he is, that there's not many people on paper that you look at and say, oh, Corda has no chance of beating. And that's a huge compliment, I think. Oh, it is. It is. Now, obviously, if he got to a semi against Djokovic, I don't think we'd be giving him a great chance to win. He could make an impression. He could make it interesting. He could make a match of it for sure because he's talented. But yes, against any of the others on his half, you have to say he's right in there. Now, Beating Bautista good in best of five is a different proposition than beating him in best of three. No doubt about that. And, uh, and then with Dennis, Dennis is a shot maker and he, he, it's tricky and he's left-handed and that match could, that could be a very sort of up and down uneven match and uh, set to set. You don't necessarily know what to expect from Dennis, but these are matches that Corda, he, he doesn't have to feel he's out of his league at all. He's got, he's gained so much experience in the last six months. And I think he has an entirely different view of himself and where he's headed. And it's happening much, much more swiftly than he would have thought back in January. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We're all so excited to see him play. Um, let's go to someone who maybe is not always so calm, cool, and collective. And that is Mr. Nick Kyrgios. And, you know, be, me being a psychology major, I, I, I want to kind of, phrased this correctly. And, and the fact that he has self-admittedly stated he knows his body will not hold up um, the entire two weeks of a slam, that actually, I feel that actually allows him to play with absolutely zero pressure because he knows he's not out there to win the slam. He can just play totally free. He doesn't care if he plays Novak in the first round, if he plays Novak in the quarters, it doesn't matter to him. He'll play anyone, anywhere, anytime, any round. And it's just, that's the match that he's out there. Um, he, he will continue most likely not making a lot of noise during the second weeks of slams just because his body won't hold up. But with this approach, he will continue to wreak havoc during the first week of, of major tournaments. Well, certainly three of the four. I don't know necessarily if it, if it would trans, translate to Roland Garros, but, but certainly all the rest, he can make a lot of noise. 
I think it's very unfortunate. I mean, you're saying something that's absolutely true, David, but then you have to say, okay, Nick, what's wrong with training year round? Why are you telling the trainer when he comes out during the match against Felix that you, you'd been working really hard? I don't know if he said you're training really hard or working really hard for two weeks. What's two weeks? Why wasn't there a deeper commitment? Why isn't there a, a deeper commitment? That's what I can't figure out about him because he's, in an, he's a rare talent. He's so gifted. And I, I hate to see it wasted because I was one of the people that thought back in 2014, 15, there's no way he wasn't going to win a bunch of majors. Now I'm convinced we will absolutely never see it. And Yeah, you really remember the match, you're, the match you're referring to, he blew Rafa off the court. You don't push Rafa off any court like that. And he and he really did. And, and well, Wimbledon. Rafa had come from winning the French. He was a little beat up. And Nick won a couple of clutch tie breaks to, in, in that match to beat Rafa. But it was a great effort. Served 37 aces. Just phenomenal. But yeah, back in those days, you thought, okay, how, how can he miss? How can he really get... how? How much can he get in his own way? Well, he has gotten in his own way. And look, I don't mean this in a mean-spirited way because I think the fans love him and I think he's an endearing character in many ways. But I, I don't like the fact that it's not a total commitment. For that reason, I'm happy that Felix got the win and can move on and play Zara because I, I, I just think, you know, he's a guy that's working hard every single week, every day of his career. You know, he's, he's thinking about the game and, and his own fitness. So yeah, that's how it's I, just interesting. Like to me, like psychologically, I don't think you have any other player that goes into a tournament thinking like he does, which allows him to play the way he does. But yeah, I mean, it's his ultimately at the end of the day, it's his choice. It's sad for all of us to see the immense talent that he has, and he's not going to be able to put it all together if he continues on this way. But um, it's now, I will intriguing to watch. Thing, David, David, sorry to interrupt. One thing I did hear from somebody who's I uh, that I met at Wimbledon, who I know is knows what he's talking about and talks to people that knew Nick well. And many, and this is back five, six years ago. And he said that there were apparently Nick really could have used a serious back surgery at one stage and just didn't want to do it. So I also wonder whether in some cases he's just foregone that if he's just decided, no, I'm not going to go through that. When maybe again, perhaps something like that could have made his career very different than it's been. Yeah, we'll never know. We'll never know about that. He might not ever talk about it. But I remember hearing that story. And my source was a good one, uh, right. who I believed. And, and so I wonder again, and, and it, it was borne out by the fact of what we're seeing right now, because in those years, we didn't always know about the suffering. And, he, and it wasn't as apparent, but it's become more and more so and sadly so. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see what's uh, what, what he next brings up to the court. We, we never know what it quite is. But you know, he is, he is entertaining. We'll tell you that he does bring fans to the game. Um, Andy Murray. I mean, that was, that was pretty incredible. I know he got drilled by Dennis Shapovalov, but those first two rounds were pretty damn inspiring, especially playing at Wimbledon and um, to see him battle after all he's gone through. I mean, I watched that documentary on him. I mean, the, the work that he's had to put in to even get back on a tennis court is incredible. And to see him competing like he did the first couple of rounds was, was, was awesome to see. It was awesome. And to think that here's a two-time Wimbledon champion, you know, and, and beating Novak Djokovic in one of those finals and Roundich in the second, 2013, 2016, he wins this tournament. His pride in just getting out there and trying to do that. I honestly think he would say when his career is over, it was worth it for him, even though he was somewhat humiliated by Dennis, that it was worth it to get the two wins that he had to hold off Basilis Vili and, and win in the second round in five sets and then earn that right to play uh, Shapovala was really, it's to his credit that he, that it means so much to him to hear those cheers and to put himself on the line. However, I just don't know how much longer uh, he's, he's going to be able to, I, I, I just wonder past this year, will he really be able to play singles anymore? I, I have my doubts. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But it was it was great to see. Um, Coco Goff, you know, this was a potential tomorrow's match could have been a potential Coco uh, Serena Williams match. That's not going to happen, obviously, because what happened with Serena in the first round. But she faces Kerber tomorrow. Um, Coco's been playing well. I don't think she's lost a set yet. Am I? Oh, right? she hasn't. She hasn't. Yeah, I don't right. think she's lost a set. No. yet. The forehand's no. looking good. The second serve is looking a little bit better. Um that's going to be a good one tomorrow. 
I'm fascinated by that match because I, I just wondering, uh, can, can she deal with the Germans defense? Kerber is going to be running down every ball. And she's, she's a very wily strategist. She's a left-hander. Can, well, I, I think Coco will get on to Angie's serve, but then again, I think she'll have some difficulty holding her own serve and she's going to be dealing with an opponent who's got an awful lot of guile in her game. I mean, I, I, youth is on Coco's side, but obviously experience clearly on the other side of the net. I think it's going to be very close and hard, but whoever wins that match is going to get a big lift that could carry them right on to the final uh, conceivably. Yeah. The semi, I said, if, if, Coco wins. If she beats Kerber, she plays one more match in the quarter. There's a potential Ash Barty semifinal, which would be right. something right. to watch. That would be something yeah. to see. Yeah, now Ash, um, is, Ash has been a little up and down so far, and she was up a set in three love, two breaks uh, yesterday, and then really had some trouble closing it out, and uh, which I think maybe diminished her confidence a bit. If she could have run that match out comfortably, it, was, it looked like her best performance of the of the week uh, up until then. So there's still some shaky patches and you just wonder, uh, I, she won't get away with that from here on in. Now the opposition gets tougher and she won't, the lapses will not be, uh, they're, they're, the lapses will be much more costly. So, but on the other hand, maybe she lifts her game now. Maybe she really finds it. Cause we've always thought she was a great grass court player. Now she's just got to go out and prove it. Yeah, another fascinating match on the on the women's side that I'm looking forward to watching tomorrow is Iga Swiatek versus Anja Jabor. Anja Jabor had a monster win over Muguruza. Um, Anja, I, I've talked about it a, a few times and credit to my friend, uh, my good friend Megan, who who told me about her a few years back. It's it's so cool to watch Anja play because not many players play like her. I mean, she will slice and dice you, finesse you, you know, drop shot, not give you two of the same balls in a row through an entire set. <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty fun to watch. I, that's going to be a good one. I, I don't have a pick on that one. It's going to be really close. I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, because on the other side of the net, you have Sviantec who's, who's such a, uh, she can be a ball machine when she's on and also, but still be aggressive. She can go long stretches without missing and still be, take the initiative when she can. And, Question will be, can she deal with all that variety? Is that going to get her frustrated? Is it going to bring out some angst? Or is she just going to be in that sort of methodical uh, mindset that's going to enable her to just shake it off and keep getting one more ball back? I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that match a lot, too. She has obviously the experience on her side, having won the French last year. That could help her. But, wow, I, I, she's, she's going to have her work cut out for her tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one to watch. I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, Mr. Federer. We said the little rough start, like you said, the, the first three sets against Manorino were not good, but um, he was tested yesterday. I mean, uh, that, that was a good match yesterday, but you've got, I and mean, Cameron Norris had a, had a great year, but you're looking at Federer's draw. If you're a Federer fan, you're smiling because his draw looks pretty good. Now, again, we're getting into the latter stages here, one match in a row, but his draw is looking pretty good. Well, here's how I look at it, David. I, I think he's a clear favorite against Senego, the Italian, you know, who's quite a showman and quite a, a, quite, a quite an improved player this year, beaten Dominic team on clay, took a set up Novak in Rome as well in that same tournament. He's played some great tennis this year, just in the finals, almost won a grass court tune-up tournament, lost to Demon Hour in a very hard fought match. So I think he'll test Roger. I think Roger is going to win that match. It could be straight. It could be four, more likely four. But I don't think the draw is that simple after that, David, because, yes, you don't want him on Novak's side of the draw for sure. But on the other hand, Medvedev right now, you know, coming off a great comeback against Chilich from two sets down and conceivably ready to win tomorrow. If Roger faces him, that'll be a very tough battle, could be very tight. And then if he were to win that and get to the semis, he's conceivably going to play either Berrettini or Zarev. Yeah. which it, two big servers and Zarev he in particular, I think is one that he, he would be concerned about. Uh, he has great respect for Zarev and he also knows Berrettini is, is a vastly improved player. So let me, let me stop you one sec. Are you, are yeah. you, pretty, are you pretty clear that Zverev is going to, going to beat Felix tomorrow? Are you pretty confident? I feel that way. I mean, I'd be very impressed if Felix pulled it off. I like Zarev's chances probably in four sets because he's had a good history against Felix. And listen, maybe it's a step up moment for Felix. I'm not counting Felix out, but I, I, I definitely believe that it's Zarev is going to be in Zarev's hands tomorrow. And unless 
you know, he, he goes through some something of an emotional crisis or gets frustrated. And I, he's been competing well and had a nice four set win over Taylor Fritz. Yeah, I like his chances over Felix and, and I like Berrettini to win tomorrow and have those two meet in the quarters. Now, maybe that's just because I want the matchup, just like I want the Federer Medvedev matchup. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, also, but, but also analytically, that's what I think is going to happen. I think those four will go through. And we uh, really haven't spent a lot of time on him, but but we have to end with him. Mr. Uh, Djokovic, just, he lost his first set against young uh, Jack Draper, but since then he's uh, he's just been pretty much cruising a lot. It's amazing. That second round matchup versus Kevin Anderson was actually the final in 2018. At yeah, Obviously, right. Kevin's dealt with a lot of injuries and stuff, but um, Nothing looks to be really slowing Novak down. Uh, no, least. no, he's he looks fine. He, he did have some, he definitely was, uh, I don't want to use the word churlish, that's not an accurate one, but he was definitely a little bit uptight when he played uh, Kudla uh, because Dennis gave him a lot of junk and then he sometimes felt like he had to break, de- de- he had to break up Kudla's rhythm and he threw in some soft slices. It wasn't necessarily an enjoyable match for him to play. He got going for a while. Broken the last game of the first set for 6-4. Breeze got, he broke him a couple of times in the second set. And then the third got shaky. And Novak was down 1-4 in the third. And he was also down 1-4 in the tiebreak. He came all the way back and, and, and won it. And that was not his best tennis. But I think that's because he shifted from center over to one and played a guy that really, you know, is a journeyman, but who played a very smart match, Kudla, and was working hard to get his ranking back up higher again. So, I don't think Djokovic will be dissatisfied with losing one set over the course of the three matches and being tested by Kudla a little bit. And I do think he'll be, uh, David, much sharper against Garen tomorrow, uh, who is a young player that he respects. Uh, you know, And Garen, of course, is, is seated 17. So that, that tells you the status of this guy. So Novak will take it very seriously. Back on center, I think we're going to see something closer to... We're going to see Djokovic start the, the movement toward peak of his powers is the way I see it. That's where maybe the first step toward trying to peak is winning that round of 16 match on his own terms. Yeah. I'm smiling. Cause I'm so excited for tomorrow. It's the, you know, again, this is the last middle Sunday off. You can make a very strong argument that tomorrow is the best day of tennis for the year. When you have all eight men's matches and all eight women's matches, people sometimes say, you know, the old super Saturday of Flushing Meadows, when you had a men's semi, then you had the ladies final followed by the other men's semi. Um, those are three matches right here. You got eight of the best men's matches remaining, eight of the best women's matches remaining. Um, and so many tomorrow being the holiday, a lot of people aren't working tomorrow. So they really yeah. get to sit and enjoy it. That's true, David. And so many of them are such appealing matchups. I don't think we can go too far wrong. They're just so many good ones and so many unpredictable ones. So I, I, I think that, for anybody living on the East Coast, they've got it made because you, you, you get up and have your breakfast about 5.15, tune in starting at 6, and then you could be watching the tennis uh, on, on two different channels all the way up till about 4 in the afternoon. It's a smorgasbord tomorrow. It's the best. It's the best. Hey, you got a, you got a winner for me on the women's side and the men's side, or you're not going there yet? Well, I still, I still believe that Djokovic will win the tournament. I don't have a, a, I don't have a women's favorite. I still like his chances because I do think that he, all things being equal, he should be able to get past anybody on his half of the draw. And that's not selling a Rublev short in the quarters. That could be a nice test. And who knows who he might meet among that, the, that group of, uh, we just discussed earlier yeah. in the semi. But I have to believe his chances are great to get to the final and then to put it all on the line in the final. I, and with him going for the slam, I do like his chances. but. The women's, I don't have a, David, I'm not going near it right now. <laughs> yeah, it's wide open. This Are is you, so great. Do you, have, hey. do you have a feel for who's going to win the women's? I mean, uh, it's so wide open. I mean, I'm looking at, I mean, let, I mean, if, if you look at, if I'm I mean, you can, make through, a case, you can make a case for Ash based on her grass court ability. You can make a case for the winner of Coco and Kerber to just keep barreling on through. You can on the make, other side. Ons, if Ons could get by Sviatek, I mean, she, uh, it's, it's that other side is crazy, but um, yeah, you Bab- got- Babalenka's one, I think is very, is very dangerous. She had it, yeah. you know, she had some anxious moments the first week, but starting to play better again. And when she's on, I think she might be the best player out there when she's on. And when she's emotionally, you know, when she's mentally at her best at her strongest and emotionally c- calm, 
then uh, I, I, I think she's fantastic with ability to hit winner after winner. But again, and you my know, wish, I have one wish on the women's side. I'll tell you my one wish on the women's side. Barty Coco Semi. That's what I want. <laughs> I take that. I take that any day of the week. I'm with you. Steve, this is much fun. The next time we talk, we're going to have, it's going to be done. It goes so quick. We're going to have winners. So um, everybody enjoy the heck out of tomorrow. Steve, Steve described it perfectly on the East coast, wake up five, five 15 and, and settle <laughs> in because you're going to see some unbelievable tennis. So yeah. Steve, thanks again. And, and everybody this enjoy tomorrow. Cause it's going to be unbelievable. You too, David, looking forward to it.